Hi, I'm Ray Arias. I'm speaking to you from uh, my front steps at my home in an undisclosed location within the neighborhood of in town in Champaign, Illinois. And so I'm here to review the state legislature debates uh, that happened some week and a half ago. <laughs> It's been a while, so I've been cutting down material, sifting stuff down, doing research. Uh, my wife here has been helping me a lot, and she, she did the slight graphics and everything. Um, let's see, first of all, um, I want to present like a broad brush of the Democrats, at least the ones running for a legislature around here. Uh, they that there's no way to cut the budget any further, that there's no safe cuts that can be made. Um, they don't want any term limits for the most part. There, there is one that was in favor, but the, the other two not in favor of term limits. Um, and they favor aggressive income tax. Now, to do a little broad for summary of the Republicans. They're not at all like Tea Party stuff that you see federally. Like, oh my gosh, we got problems with voter fraud. You know, um, all this, uh, all this kind of wacky stuff. They're more reasonable, and, and there are even a lot of positions I could agree with. Um, they see many cuts that could be made in the budget. They do want term limits and they are mostly against the progressive income tax because they see it as scaring a lot of businesses and well-off people away from Illinois. Now, in general, uh, the 103rd tends to be more liberal democratic. This is a uh, campus town after all. Um, the 104th is more out there, um, more rural, so they tend to be conservative and Republican. And the 52nd Senate uh, District, which includes both, they tend to flip back and forth between parties, and they usually pick someone that's centrist. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. This is a map of the Illinois 52nd Legislative District, commonly known as the 52nd Senate District. The 103rd Representative District is part of this and covers uh, Champaign-Urbana. And the 104th Representative District is the other part of it and covers a bulk of Champaign and Vermilion counties, um, excluding the 103rd District. In the 103rd District, running on the Democratic ticket is Naomi Jacobson. And the following is basic summary of her platform. To a progressive income tax. 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 You guessed it. Naomi Jacobson would like to pass a Illinois constitutional amendment to make the flat tax into a progressive income tax. Uh, she believes this will balance the budget, pay for state pensions, pay on the state's debt, pay for Medicaid, and prevent the necessity for further cuts. Uh, she's running on her accomplishments of revamping U of I's Lincoln Hall, protecting jobs, introducing a bill to prohibit PCBs, and eliminating legislative scholarships. I want to continue on my priorities. Education, affordable and accessible health care, human services, and the environment. We ended the death penalty. We eliminated legislative scholarships. We have civil unions. And we saved Health Alliance as an insurance option for state and university employees and retirees in Central Illinois. I'm able to bring a perspective to the General Assembly from downstate. I've been able to take leadership in the state while representing our great area. I chair the House Higher Education Committee. For the past two years, I've served as the House Chair of the Conference of Women Legislators, and that's bipartisan by bipartisan organization. I believe I'm the first downstater to have had that office, leading a statewide organization. I've been appointed to the Midwest Higher Education Commission. I was recently appointed to serve on the Environment Committee of the National 
national conference of state legislators. I think everybody would agree that one of the most pressing problems in Illinois is our budget and the budget deficit that we face, and I think that wraps up a lot of, uh, it, it combines many of the problems in, in one. And uh, the way I would address this is by getting past the uh, constitutional amendment that I introdu introduced to move our state from a flat tax to a progressive income tax. It's the only way that we're going to be able to get out of our deficit. It's the only way we're going to be able to start paying off our uh, debts to pay our pensions. And that's, you know, that's certainly one of the problems. And uh, to be able to move the state forward. Rob Meister is running on the Republican ticket, and here is a summary of what he believes is Illinois' biggest problem. Corruption in Illinois is a corruption. That gets full of our uh, corruption problem. And corruption without corruption cause is not every corrupt politician. People may say that they're tired of hearing Rob Meister say the word corruption all the time. But I believe he would say that he is just as tired of seeing corruption in Illinois government all the time as well. Um, just an aside, um, I believe both Jacobson and Meister are right. But Jacobson is more right than Meister because even if you get rid of all the corruption, all the overspending in Illinois government, at best it would knock a very small hole in the, uh, the budget, um, whereas a, a progressive income tax would give us a whole lot more revenue to work with. Moving on with Meister's bio, he's a local business owner who sees many problems with Illinois government. Uh, among these problems are a culture of corruption, underfunded education, and a state government that's not friendly to businesses. Uh, he would like to work with businesses and get the things done that need to be done. Uh, the community that is in this area raised me to believe many things. Uh, you believe me that you made me believe that if I have a little extra time, I should try to use it to, for good. I should donate it. I should offer it up to someone that needs it. That if I have extra money, that I should try to see if I can donate it and see if I can help somebody else progress in life. We're getting away from our sense of community and starting to be overtaken by a large government. And a lot of us feel that if this uh, government was working, that uh, that would not be a problem. But unfortunately what we see consistently is that Illinois as a government continues to fail us. It continues to not give us a return on our investment. It continues to fall short on a lot of promises it makes. And I think one of the best ways for us to get back to that is to create an economy that will not only be friendly to businesses, but it will also be a more friendly place for nonprofits to be able to grow and expand and be able to help the people that need it. As we can see by what happens when you run a deficit consistently, what starts to happen is no matter how badly you want to help the people that need help, you cannot do it if you're broke. You cannot do it if you don't have extra time. And Illinois should be able to make a way that we as a, we as a community can come together and show what Champaign-Urbana does so well and make that the entire culture of Illinois as a whole. The three biggest things we have is that we have a culture of corruption in Illinois that we have to fix. Um, we have uh, an underfunded education system, which is actually 49th in the education spending that it gets from the state. Um, and I think we have to show that we're going to be willing to be more business friendly. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what we see with having budget shortfalls comes from the fact that it's very difficult for us to know what we can afford. Uh, a very conservative estimate by the FBI is that we lose $500 million a year just in corruption. That could fully fund a lot of schools. Um, and the non-conservative judgment is 1.2 billion every year. We have to fix that problem. Yeah, Illinois has a lot of problems right now, um, and they're not—they're not Republican problems. They're not Democrat problems. They're politician problems. We have too many people in, in active office that don't have enough experience outside in the public or private sectors. Um, they're not ingrained in a lot of what we've had to deal with with this economy. And they continue to spend more than they make without any real solid way of solving the problems. And it continues to make a lot of us consider leaving and tell people like me are going to stay here and they're going to create jobs and businesses here that are going to be able to grow and create a better, brighter state. We're never going to be able to overcome our corruption problem. We're never going to be able to overcome our deficit problem. I wish that corruption was not an issue in Illinois. We are still the reigning champion of it. Still. And what corruption causes is not only theft taxpayer money, but it causes a lower price, of, a lower cost of care, lower quality of care, lower service, 
and then hope that maybe I accidentally have them quit or get fired. That's not what we can do here. We have to actively find out who it is. We need to take the handcuffs off of the people that can find out who's doing it, and we need to make sure that every corrupt politician finds a new job or spend some time in our brain. <laughs> Just putting up the map again to remind everyone that the 104th district covers the bulk of Champaign and Vermilion counties, excluding the 103rd district, which only covers Champaign Urbana. And running for the 104th district is the incumbent Chad Hayes, Republican, He's the former mayor of Catlin, Illinois. Received a number of awards from various business organizations. Says he could make more money working in the private sector, but chooses instead to serve the state and the district. He's helped to implement over $12 million in cost savings and performance improvement initiatives. I felt like when I ran two years ago that I bought significant private sector experience. I was mayor of my hometown of Cavan, Illinois, for eight years. I'm proud to tell you we balanced the budget eight times in a row. I didn't really think of that as much of an accomplishment until I got to Springfield, frankly. Uh, we lived within our means. We had X number of dollars coming in. That's all we could spend. It was not negotiable. The buck stopped with me. I was fine with that. I reveled in that role. Also, I have significant private sector experience. I was a, a vice president at the United Samaritans Medical Center. I work with multi-million dollar budgets. Again, the buck stopped with me to make sure that in a highly regulated industry that we got it done. Much like our state, there were very difficult decisions to be made. We made them in a thoughtful, intelligent, and compassionate fashion. We ran programs that reached out to seniors, to young people in need. When I went to Springfield, I found that you ascend to the front of the line rather quickly if you have any budgetary experience. If you have any real world experience at all, if you understand anything about Medicaid or private sector growth or the business climate or standing up for downstate Illinois, and why would you send someone like me back? A physician I once worked with suggested to me, he said, Chad, would you come in my office? He said, I don't even know if you are in charge of what I'm asking you about, but I'm here in my office because you're, you're one of those guys who gets things done. And you all know these people, they're in your church, they're in your own organization, you go to them. Why? Because they get it done. Springfield has been about kicking the can down the road. It's been a, about posturing. It's been about talking points. And it's a giant circular discussion about why things cannot get done. I have no earthly interest in why we can't get things done. I'm interested in serving in this rare and special privilege of being a state representative with honor and dignity and you know, for me, as someone who is now uh, nearing the end of his first term, I think a, an appropriate question is, does he walk the walk? Is he working on things that he said that he would be working on? I'm proud to tell you that the Illinois Chamber of Commerce named me a champion of enterprise, one of only seven members of the Illinois House of Representatives who consistently voted for pro-business, pro-growth legislation. The National Federation of Indo uh, Independent Business uh, gave me the Guardian of Small Business Award again because I consistently stood up for small business, the people who generate almost every new job in this state and in this country. I'm very proud that I was named just yesterday by the Champaign County Farm Bureau, the Illinois Farm Bureau, who seated in Champaign County, a friend of agriculture, because again, agriculture, by far the number one industry in the state of Illinois, <coughs> consistently I stand up for policies that are pro-agriculture and not back those that are not pro-agriculture. Somebody told me in Springfield, they said, you know what we like about you, Hayes? You're not like all the rest of these people. Uh, you don't really seem to care uh, what's the worst that's going to happen to you. They're going to vote you out and send you back home to the private sector where you made a hell of a lot more money anyway. I think it frees me up to tell the truth, to tell it like it is, to take the tough vote. I'm willing to do it. It's long overdue, and I so appreciate the opportunity to go back and on the Democratic ticket for the 104th District is Michael Langendorf. He is a social worker living in Southeast Urbana. He saw that Hayes was running unopposed, so he decided to run against him. He's worked in various parts of Vermilion County. He promotes community college training courses, 
to prepare people for employment. I'm a longtime resident of Southeast Urbana. I am a school social worker. I work in Vermillion County. I worked at St. Elizabeth Hospital for a couple of years back in the 80s, and I've been at the uh, Vermillion Association for Special Ed as a school social worker for the last 22 years. Uh, I've worked with people in every community in Vermillion County, every town, every little place that I've worked there. I've made home visits to people's homes, their mobile homes, their places of business. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Vermillion County over the last 25 years and, and, and feel that I have a pretty good understanding of their community. I worked very hard to get on the ballot. I found out that there was no one running um, when I went to vote in the primary and felt like we need to have someone in opposition and someone to speak up for issues. I worked hard for 27 years in Vermillion County to work with uh, needy families and with children. Uh, I've worked in Springfield on and off with lobbyists and legislators now for the last 20 years. And I felt that we've been effective in working for what's best for our constituents. Um, I'm not beholden to anyone, uh, Democratic Party, in terms of funding from them, none. Special interest groups, none. So when I go to Springfield, I want to speak for my constituents and do what's best for them. We're just putting the map up one more time to show that the 52nd Senate District is made up of the combination of the 103rd Representative District and the 104th Representative District. The next debate is for the 52nd Senate District between Mike Frerichs and John Bambanick. Um, there were a couple funny moments. Uh, one time when the uh, cable TV broadcasting went out and then also um, when um, Bambanek um, gave, um, uh, well, you'll see. ticket is the incumbent um, for the 52nd Senate District, um, Mike Frerichs. He served as an Illinois State Senator for six years. He was a teacher at Rantoul Township High School. He managed Smart Structures, a local safety engineering company. He served twice in the Champaign County Board. He served as Champaign County Auditor. He advocated for a $30 billion capital improvement plan and funded improvement plans for University of Illinois, Parkland College, and Danville Community College. Okay. My name is Mike Frisch. I'm the state senator for the 52nd District. I've had the honor of serving Champaign-Urbana and champaign Vermilion County as the state senator for the last six years. It truly has been a pleasure to serve my home area. I grew up around here. I have family around here. My friends are around here. And it really is a pleasure every day to be able to help and to give back to around here gave an awful lot to me growing up, and I feel I have an obligation to give back. Uh, in that time in office, I've been able to work on things to improve 
much that means to you, how much it affects you, and uh, that's what I hope to continue to do for the next four years if the if voters honor you with their vote. Uh, and the state of Illinois has some big problems, but I think our top priority are making sure we pass a balanced budget, make sure we keep our spending in line, at the same time protecting our priorities. We should never lose sight of that. Now, I think our priorities for the state of Illinois are education, whether it's K through 12 or higher education, health care, and public safety. So we need to make sure that we're responsible in our spending and that we're efficient in where we are so that we can continue to fund those priorities. Uh, I also believe that this education, making sure we reform our schools so that every child in the state of Illinois has an equal opportunity to higher education or whatever path they want to go. I just think it's immoral that certain children have certain advantages based on what street they're born onto. We need to rectify that. And I think we also need to protect our environment, whether that's our drinking water with the threat of PCBs over the Mohammed Aquifer, or whether the threat of fracking in other parts of the state of Illinois, what chemicals might be pumped into our water. Uh, we need to make sure that our future generations continue to have clean drinking water and clean air. And finally, the challenger for the 52nd Senate District is John Babinick, Republican. He's an expert in information security, forensics, and fraud prevention a conservative activist. He advocated for fiscal responsibility and pension reform in putting a stop to corruption. He authored the book, Illinois Deserves Better. And he is the only candidate here that has had the rare honor of once appearing in The Daily Show. And here is the clip. This year, Congress pushed daylight savings time up by three weeks to this Sunday. But what they didn't realize is that computers built before 2005 weren't programmed to handle this change. Today, computer experts are panicking. It's not a big deal. The programmers just need to go in and fix some code. Uh, it's going to be a minor inconvenience to everybody else. Computer experts are panicking. It's really a big problem. There will be hell on the streets. The nukes will launch. We'll be hit with blood. Holy! By the way, I should say that no copyright infringement was intended, and we totally claim fair use on that one. And here's what John Babinick had to say about his case. Uh, my name is John Babinick. I'm running for the state senate here in the 52nd district, which includes the bulk of Champaign and Vermillion County. Um, I'm a small businessman. My my uh, career is actually in information security. I deal with Russian hackers trying to steal money out of your checking account and your credit card. Uh, so essentially, dealing with international organized crime. And you might think that's an odd career to then jump into politics. Uh, but I can think of no better training for Illinois politics than dealing with organized crime. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, and, and that's good uh, to have some levity, but you know, Illinois is a state in crisis, and we're facing real problems with our state budget, with high taxes, with jobs leaving the state, high unemployment. Uh, and I'm not really happy the direction the state's going, so I've decided uh, to run for office. Uh, the first problem is the state budget and the ongoing state fiscal crisis. Uh, after years, uh, particularly under Robin Williams, the state budget exploded, programs exploded, and he was impeached for creating a lot of spending he was not, he was not authorized to do. Uh, the net result of that was the income tax act that was passed last year. We need to get our state budget under control, uh, but we can't use the past as a benchmark for how to go forward. If we impeach Robert Wade Witcher for his misuse of the state budget, we can't turn around and say, okay, we're going to accept that these are the budget levels, these are the programs that exist, and we need to go forward with that. We need to get our budget under control and repeal the tax hike that I would argue wasn't needed to be passed in the first place. The second is our jobs plan. Unemployment has gone up uh, almost double in the last six years. As the national unemployment number or national unemployment is going down, unemployment here in Champaign and Vermillion County is going up. I want my children to be able to find jobs here. I want them to be able to build their lives here. And too many people I talk to are not able to do that. And that's all the candidates that were in this series of debates. Now I'm going to go down some issues and look at their positions. I have recordings of some of what uh, some of the candidates say, but not all of them. 
So I will just play significant portions of um, those that I do have. The first issue we'll be looking at is the pension for state employees because the state is getting very behind on paying them. Uh, Rob Meister believes that sharing the burden with local government and school districts may be an option, but it's not preferred because then property taxes will go up. Uh, Naomi Jacobson believes that a progressive state income tax would solve the issue as well as other issues. Michael Lagendorf says the pensions cannot be reduced and that the school districts and local governments cannot be burdened um, with paying the difference. Uh, so the key is to renegotiate the pensions. Chad Hayes says that the Illinois Constitution forbids reducing pensions and that shifting the burden to local governments and school districts would not be workable. Uh, McFrerick says a reduction of school pensions is unconstitutional and um, shifting the cost to local governments and school districts is not workable for him as well. And so he is in favor of renegotiating the pensions also. Um, John Babinick says that going forward, the pensions can be changed. Uh, he's opposed to shifting the cost uh, without any hard property tax. Um, I think that they could be shared uh, with the local governments because then we would have a little more control over taking care of our state employees. But it is a dangerous path to go down to because it, it's probably the only way that property taxes are going to continue to rise is if we shift them to local government. Thank you. And I believe I have uh, said more than once what I believe the state needs to do to resolve the pension uh, deficit, and that is to have a progressive income tax, which will increase the revenue for the state of Illinois and be able to start paying that off. Next, we're going to look at the issue of going to a progressive income tax, which would take a state constitutional amendment, which would mean that it would have to go on the ballot and be um, voted in by a majority of Illinoisans. Um, obviously, <laughs> as uh, Naomi Jacobson has already said, um, she is fully in favor of a progressive income tax and believes that it would solve many of the state's problems. Uh, Rob Meister says that a progressive income tax um, is something he can live with, but he's not in favor of it because he believes that uh, many of the better off people and um, businesses that are doing pretty well would start to leave Illinois because they'll be paying a lot of taxes. Michael Langendorf is in favor of it. Chad Hayes has said um, that um, the last uh, tax increase, um, he voted no. And if, if there were such an option and a button that said his words, hell no, that that's what he would have voted for. And he is not in favor of changing the taxes in Illinois in any way. Um, whether it be a progressive tax or any other tax. Um, so basically, I put that for his answer, quote, unquote, hell no. By the way, I wish I had that recorded, but I don't. Uh, anyway, Mike Frerix, uh would be in favor, but he says he would like to take a look at cutting wasteful spending. And John Babinick says he's not in favor um, same reasoning as Rob Meister that uh, many better off people and many businesses based in Illinois would then start to leave Illinois in droves. And in an effort to address the state's deficit, anyway. I introduced a constitutional amendment to move the state from having a flat cap tax income tax to a progressive income tax. This is the only way the state will be able to meet its financial obligations. For most people in this area, their income taxes would actually go down. High-income people would see their taxes increase. 
But when I talk to my constituents about this, and even those whose taxes would increase, most agree that a progressive income tax is the right way to get that on the ballot in 2014, which is my goal, and there, I've been talking to people all over. They are very interested in working on this so that we can have that on the ballot because that would take a constitutional amendment. And it's possible to make constitutional changes. Uh, then we'll be able to move forward, increase our revenue. I believe that uh, we can really show that um, it's something that we need to be able to have a balanced budget, that it's definitely something we should at least consider as an option. Uh, one of the most difficult things that a lot of taxpayers have is that they, they believe that there is a lot of waste and a lot of misspending that happens in our budget. We do take in quite a lot of money with the new income increase. We felt like the legislator was going to prove to us that they could finally have a balanced budget. And unfortunately, they didn't do a balanced budget. What they did was they still spent even more money after we were hoping that they were going to show us that they wouldn't. Um, so I think that a progressive income tax is a, is a possibility. I don't like the idea of doing it. I think that what it's going to do is scare a lot of people uh, into leaving Illinois, and that's one of the biggest problems we have right now is tax increases and cut, cut, cutting spending doesn't mean much when you continue to lose the people in the state that pay those taxes. Next issue we move on to is the state budget and the debt backlog. Naomi Jacobson uh, says that she has helped to pass Bell's budget and that new revenue is paying some of the old debt, but that the progressive tax will um, be the final solution to this problem as well as many others. Rob Meister says um, the key is to create a, a broader tax base and to keep track of spending and to make all kinds of cuts. Uh, Michael Langendorf says that the progressive income tax will solve the problem. Chad Hayes says that the budgets are being redone um, and that, um, you know, a balanced budget has been passed. He's also one of the ones that helped pass the balanced budget. Um, some of the debt is being paid and that um, Medicaid is being looked into, make sure people are eligible actually live in Illinois, etc. Uh, Mike Ferrick says um, passing budgets that have uh, more revenue than spending is what the key is here. And John Babinick says uh, pretty much the same thing, take in more revenue than goes out. And he believes that there is still uh, plenty of fat to First cut, of all, as he David, puts it. Uh, we have passed a balanced budget in the last couple of years. That was a bipartisan commitment in the House. We were the ones who set that uh, number. We looked at the revenue very carefully and made sure that the budget we passed would be a balanced budget. And we said that any additional revenue that came in over and above what we uh, saw as, as anticipated and that we budgeted for would be used to pay back old bills. So we are making some progress, albeit way too slow. But uh, you're going to hear it again. I think the right way to, uh, the only way we're going to get to paying back our old bills uh, in a more timely fashion is to move the state to express the income tax, which will not raise taxes for most of the people in the state of Illinois. But my hope is that we don't need to make further cuts. Um, I, I believe that we have cut and cut and cut. And what we really need to do is look at where the money how is being spent? Uh, yeah, I think uh, that, that brings up a good point. Um, it is certainly an option. I think that's still one of our best ways, uh, which a lot of economists say is one of the best ways for Illinois to get out of its problems, is to create a broader tax base. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have is dealing with one taxpayer leaving every 10 minutes. And it's not because of high taxes, it's because they feel like they're being spent inappropriately. If uh, we can show that we're going to be more responsible and we can have some long-term plans for how we spend our money, uh, I think that's going to be able to convince a lot more people to stay here. And then regardless of what we might have to do, whether it keep the current tax code or whether it be a progressive tax, people will be more likely and more opening to going down that path if they feel like the money is actually being spent correctly. Honestly, one of the biggest ways that we could cut it is in our political system. Uh, Illinois has the second highest paid elected officials. And we're not second highest in anything. Actually, we're 47, 48, and 49 in just about everything we've got. So we're not getting a return on our investment. We have very nice health care packages for our representatives, even though we can't afford the health care packages they get. Uh, they get paid more than the average business owner does, even though uh, they
is by making our politicians work for what they get and they don't need to be making this much. And next we will take a look at Illinois' problem with the overcrowding of its prisons. Uh, I believe the moderators gave a statistic of the uh, incarceration rate in Illinois is 373 out of every 100,000 people is incarcerated, which is more than all the countries in the world except sev seven countries, all but seven, and three times the median rate in the world of incarceration, and um, what do they propose to do about it? Uh, Naomi Jacobson said, uh, said that uh, she would like to re-examine sentencing. Um, you know, this is the argument, uh, more nonviolent crimes, uh, they should look for alternatives to prison, um, things like that. And also to uh, make it so there are education opportunities in prison and books in the prison libraries. Rob Meister um, says that if we improve the economy, people will see other things to do than to go commit crimes, and that will improve things. Michael Langendorf um, and Chad Hayes uh, both agree that uh, sentencing needs to be reexamined. Mike Frerix, uh says that uh, more alternatives need to be used, such as home confinement, um, things like that, and to also have a separate, uh, well he implies, he, he said that he used to work in a drug court in St. Louis, and implying that something like that system uh, would do us good here. Also John Babinick um, is along the same lines in that he says a, a mental health court well, I think one of the absolute best things we can have is a better economy. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, statistics that come out of that are because we have so many people that live in poverty. We have so many people that live in bad situations that they start to feel like crime is their only way out. I would like to be able to create a better culture for them where they feel like they can have the correct opportunities for education or a, a well-paying job that uh, they'll be able to have better and other options than committing crimes. Um, it's very expensive to house those criminals, and we actually found out that two million uh, dollars of our payroll taxes were still being shifted into people that were in prison. So they're costing us double. Um, I think that if we create a better culture where, um, especially small mom and pop businesses can grow, um, they'll be able to hire a lot of people right now that are having to struggle to make that decision of crime or a job, and it'll make that decision much easier for them. I think one of the ways to reduce the prison rate that we have. First of all, is to uh, you know look at some of the sentencing, but also make sure that people are receiving the education that they need. When uh, people are educated, uh, first of all, you know they're they're going to be able to get jobs. They they understand the implications of some of the crimes that they might be considering, and if they're educated, uh, they're not going to be committing those. Also, I think what we need to look at is the education for the prison population. <coughs> now, we need to make sure that uh, we, do, we reduce recidivism. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that the people who are incarcerated have the opportunity to continue their education, have the opportunity just to be able to read while they're incarcerated. We've cut back on our libraries and our prison systems so that people aren't even can't even have access to the books that people collect. Um, the first thing, there, there are several reasons people interact with the criminal justice system. One is that they, they're truly malicious people and they need to be treated as such. You know, but there are people with mental health problems. The symptom might be they're engaging in, in criminal behavior, but the problem is mental health. And adopting a mental health court, which we're starting to do in Champaign, so that we treat the problem, not the symptoms. Let's get the people on whatever medicine they need to do so they can be productive members of society. Champaign is a pioneer in drug and alcohol court. The problem is the alcoholism or the drug addiction. Treat those problems, hold people accountable to what they're doing so that they don't intersect with the criminal justice system. Uh, I had a sister who was a heroin addict, and, and she did have a record, but the problem was is that she was an addict and did things to get drugs. To solve that problem is to treat the source of the problem. 
you know, and the third talking about the general incarceration. You know, we really should sell state incarceration as a recourse for people who are a threat to public safety and use other means to address those who are not, uh, whether it's fines, restitution, things of that sort, alternative funds. Yeah, I think you will find a lot of disagreement on this one. But we're at a time right now where we have an all-time high in our state prison population, nearly 40, 49,000 inmates. And with those prisons we have, we're built to 33,000. And because we're needing to cut back on expenses, we're seeing the government imposing closing prisons which I think ultimately makes our prison system more difficult. Uh, it's more dangerous for the people incarcerated and for the people working there, and more difficult more dangerous for our communities. And so one of the things I just I worked with Sheriff Walsh here in Champaign County, uh, because of a problem he had to help with increase the use of electronic home confinement. You know, there are some people who are not a threat to their, to their neighbors, they're not dangerous, they're a threat to themselves and their addiction. And we need to make sure that we've got people that have the ability to go out and be productive members of society to work and be less of a financial burden on our community. And also, I worked in a drug court in St. Louis about 14 years ago and saw all the wonders that this concept was starting and how they can rehabilitate people's lives. The answer is not just to put them behind bars and hope they come out with their problems solved, but to actually work with them and that in the long run is going to save us more money and make us more safe. Next, we'll look at uh, problems that service providers have receiving payments from uh, the Illinois Department of Human Services. Um, they're very behind in their payments and service providers are getting very frustrated with this. Uh, Naomi Jacobson says that the progressive tax will solve this problem just as it will solve other problems. Uh, Rob Meister says that there is a lot of health care waste that needs to be trimmed. Uh, Mike Ferrick says we must be careful not to be cutting the wrong things. And John Babinick says that there are a lot of cuts that are needed um, to we be have made to solve this problem. services, and they have been very painful cuts. Uh, the revenue for the state of Illinois has been down. It's been down for a number of years. And for a number of years, when the uh, legislature worked on the state budget, they uh, would just let the human services come in and tell them what they needed. And I mean, they didn't do it only for human services, but for many of the agencies. And um, pretty much they would say, all right, that's what you're going to have. And at the end of somewhere in that coming year, in that fiscal year that they set, there wasn't enough money. And so then the agencies got behind, uh, the state got behind the agency's payments. That's one of the reasons for those late payments. Um, when we started passing a balanced budget, at least now the agencies know what to count on, and I believe they all like that. They don't like the cuts. None of us like the cuts, but um, until we have a progressive income tax, we're going to be behind in our late Thank you for the question. I, uh, I think that one of the biggest things that we see across Illinois in a lot of ways, especially with health care, is that that's what ends up happening when we, when we can't be fiscally responsive, responsible is that we go down this road and it's either a cut or a tax and no way in between. Um, but fortunately, we actually have problems that are, we can turn into opportunities. One of the problems we have is that in other aspects of health care, we pay three times more for prescription refills. We have one out of five people coming into our state to use our health care, but then not paying for it and going back home. There's a lot of loopholes like that that we could close. And I think if we did, that that would be a really good way for us to allocate some of the money that we do spend on health care and make sure that the people that are providing good services to the customers and the people of this fine community, that they'd be able to do it and know that they're able to stay in business and continue to provide those because they're getting paid on time. Next, we'll look at a uh, position on a hot-button topic, conceal and carry. Illinois is currently the only state that doesn't have a conceal and carry law, and so a lot of people are actually for at least looking into the issue. Naomi Jacobson is opposed because uh, most of the people in her district are opposed to it. Rob Meister is for it because he sees that could be a chance to get revenue for the state and also to f have people protect themselves. Uh, Chad Hayes is also in favor, uh, much of the same reasoning, 
Michael Langendorf um, isn't uh, a proponent of it, but he doesn't have a problem with uh, if people in the area want it, then he will go ahead and live with it, uh, as he put it. Mike Frerichs is for it. In fact, he co-sponsored um, legislation about it. And uh, John Babbitt uh, is one also. One of my cool. number one things, just as a, a small business owner, is that I really want to be able to see more revenue come to the states, that we don't have to be backed into a corner where taxation is the only way out. Uh, and I think concealed carry would be a great way for police to be able to know who is carrying a concealed weapon, uh, register sim similar to a driver's license, go through a 40 hour course. That course would cost money. I think a lot of people would be willing to pay that. Uh, it's a great way to get revenue and to, to really educate people as to how dangerous they are and get them educated to how to use them, to use them properly. And I think that it'd be one of the things that we'd see a lower crime rate and we might actually get some revenue and jobs out of it. 66% of the constituents in the 103rd district do not favor concealed carry. And so it's not only the way I believe, but it's also the way the constituents of the 103rd believe. The next issue is whether Illinois government is set up um, with a fair distribution of power within the government and also it, it narrowed down to the notion of whether or not there should be term limits uh, imposed upon the senators and the um, state representatives. Uh, Jacobson is opposed, Meister is in favor, Hayes is in favor, Langendorf is in favor, in fact that was the only debate where both candidates were in favor, Frerix is opposed to it and Babinick is in favor. Uh, Frerix had a very interesting way that said yes he believes in term limits and he calls them elections. In other words a term limit is equal to the number of terms you can get before um, your opponent is elected against you which I don't think was a very fair way of answering really that question. The idea of doing term limits for people. Uh, you have people in Illinois that have been in office for 30, 35, 40 years. If you can convince me They've been the best representative that entire time <coughs> to do so. Because I think one of the best things we could use is fresh faces and new ideas where people would come together with no preconceived notions, no party alignment that they have to follow, nothing like that. It would just be their personal beliefs uh, and the opposing personal beliefs and what can we do to come together for a best compromise. So I, I think that political uh, political culture is what we need to fix. And that's a good way to do it. There has to be a system that's in place for leadership and uh, the door is always open to me when I go to leadership and ask to talk about uh, bills that I want to move forward or talk about situations in my uh, area and for my constituents. Next we shall take a look at issues involving the state of Illinois and the main campus of the University of Illinois, also known as University of Illinois, at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, Naomi Jacobson says, uh, and, and d they all have in common that funding problems are the main issue. So I'll go ahead and skip that one for all the rest of these. Um, she also stands on her record that she did away with General Assembly uh, scholarships. Uh, Rob Meister says, in addition to funding problems, there is money waste uh, going on. Michael Legendorf um, basically emphasizing the funding problems, how to fund a U of I adequately. Um, Chad Hayes um, spoke about um, that there are too many unfunded mandates to the school and that they have to stop. Uh, the government's telling the state schools what to do while not funding all those activities adequately. And he's also standing on his record of getting rid of the legislative scholarships. And Mike Ferrick says in addition to funding there's problems with debt and he's also standing on his record of helping to vote away the General Assembly scholarships. Um, all of the incumbents uh, all voted away the General Assembly scholarships. And Babinick says in addition to funding there are problems the with let the funding slip to the University of Illinois. It's one of our biggest employers. It causes them to increase tuition at ungodly rates, uh, ones that especially people in the poor and middle class have a lot, of, uh, a lot of trouble keeping up with. And then if they can somehow rally that money together to go to school, they're usually in debt for so long that it actually would have been more cost effective for them to just go out and work. And I don't think that's the message we want to send to them. 
research take an active look at uh, how wasteful Illinois is. We were 48th of, of all 50 states for how badly and poorly we're ran. And I think that it goes to show you that there's a lot of money that we have already that we're using very, very incorrectly. And one of the first things I would love to do is put it towards education and specifically fight for it to come to the university. I want kids to be able to afford to go here, and I want innovation to start here, and I want the next uh, big job creator to come out of the university. Well, certainly, uh, one of the big issues is the funding of the university, the funding of higher education from the state. And there have been cuts made, and those years that uh, their, their budget was held level uh, were mostly because I went to leadership and I said, I'm not going to vote for a cut for the University of Illinois. Yes, um, holding level is not the same as an increase, but when there wasn't more money to give them. I think it's very important to make sure that we look at the tuition. And if the university needs to raise its tuition, they also need to make sure, and the state needs to make sure, so this will help the relationship, is that we do have more funding for the students of low-income families so that no one is left out. The university, from my understanding, the University of Illinois provides, uh, makes sure that no one is turned away from attending the university just because of means alone. And I think that's very important. Uh, I think the most important issues, at least when I work with the lobbyists of the University of Illinois, always stem from funding. And people say that money doesn't edu equal education. But I can tell you, it's a lot more difficult uh, if you don't have money. It's a lot more difficult to educate. And one of the big problems we've had in our state of Illinois is our students here are coming out with more and more debt. That in decreases the opportunities they have when they graduate. We have a lot of idealistic students who are coming out. They want to go serve in public service or perhaps take a, a low-income job, but they come out with thirty or forty thousand dollars in debt. And say, I can't do that. I've got to look for a different job. So I think that's one thing we need to work on. It's something I fought for and tried to make a priority to protect higher education from some of the cuts that need to come. Through. Uh, I think one of the other big things that we need to do this year is there's been a relationship with the General Assembly and higher education for years through General Assembly scholarships. It's really not the right word. There wasn't money tied to those. There were General Assembly waivers that just said the University of Illinois and other state institutions can't charge them. The last three years I fought to repeal that, and this year we finally. Uh, as the Senator said, I think the big thing is, is <coughs> uh, over the years, uh, and this goes to a bigger problem, we've seen the funding for institutions like Chicago State University go up you know, double digits, where U of I's funding stays flat or gets decreased. U of I is the flagship university of this state, and it should be funded accordingly and prioritized accordingly. But we see far too much emphasis on what goes on in Chicago and not enough balance to make the change. Now, we talked a little bit about mandates. The scholarship, or the legislative waiver program is one of them. Uh, the General Assembly shouldn't be in the business of imposing costs on the university that are ultimately passed down to the Chicago. And the last is concerns I have with the U of I governance structure particularly that our Board of Trustees is appointed and not elected by the voters. The net effect of this, having the Board of Trustees part of the political system, as you saw the Category I scandal, some of these crowd scandals. You know, you see ridiculous deals 